And our moderator is, as I mentioned, Dr. Ruben Ayala, that is a physician and public health specialist from Panama. He serves as Operation SMILE Chief Medical Officer and is the president of the Permanent Council of the Global Alliance for Surgical Obstetric Trauma and Anesthesia Care. Also, he represents Operation SMILE at the World Health Organization's Global Initiative for Emergency and Essential Surgical Care at United Nations Economic and Social Council. And from now on, Ruben, you're in charge. Uh, it sounds great. Uh, a huge favor. If we can move on to the next slide so I don't have to torture myself looking at this one, it would be great. Um, or, or even the next one. So good morning and good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of you. I, I, I want to first of all celebrate just the fact that even though we're in so many parts of the world, uh, as Carmen mentioned uh, originally, that, that we get a chance to come together. Uh, there's a familiarity uh, almost that is very unique to those involved in, in, in taking care of children with clefts. Um, and the fact that as you come together in a forum like this or any others, it, there's an immediate glue that brings us together uh, and it's the, the, the children. Um, so whether we've gotten a chance to work together personally or not, isn't consequential. We are working together in trying to address a, a significant problem that we all believe um, needs to be addressed. Uh, the topic for today, and, and I, I really want to thank you all for, for joining, um, is one that warrants some serious consideration. Um, as as uh, Hugh and members of the Transforming Phases and uh, team and, and uh, the, the Circle of Cleft Professionals envisioned this, this, this forum, we were, they were looking for solutions to a problem that is impacting us all. And uh, so this is a, a, a time, and what a better topic to start looking for a way ahead and to address then to address the needs uh, of people who are on the front lines trying to take care of children themselves. Um, I will take a couple more minutes of my, my time as a moderator to, to try to introduce a little bit of the topic. I don't want to do that just going through, through statistics and, 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 and articles um, that are, have been published in some of the main journals, but I, I would ask for your um, acceptance of me sharing a very personal uh, writer, uh, sort of piece that my wife wrote as she was finishing her, um, her training in, in the Mount Sinai Elmhurst Hospital in Queens in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and what it meant. And I, it's probably one of the reasons why this topic, at least personally, is, 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 is so, so pressing. Um, uh, and I, I'm sure you, you find some common ground in some of the statements. So I'll just start by, by reading her, her quick excerpt. When the news of it, and my wife's name is Anna Karina, and I can tell I'm a very proud husband, but when the news of COVID-19 broke out at the end of 2019, it all seemed so distant. Wuhan was on the other side of the world. As medical professionals, we know infectious diseases don't respect borders. With a vast ocean separating us, reassurances that all was under control and the hecticness of our daily lives, we went about our days. In February, we had no idea how this virus would end up shaping our 2020 and the formidable impact in our lives. In March, we started to receive an unexpected wave of patients and our hospital became known as the epicenter of the COVID-19 epicenter in the United States. I was starting a two month consultant liaison rotation. Things were getting challenging, not knowing what to expect, the level of protection needed, conflicting information from large government, US and global health organizations, and concerns about shortages in personal protective equipment. I decided to physically distance myself from my family out of fear of infecting, infecting them. The first time I went into a COVID-19 area, I could see marked differences between the reality of the moment versus what would one typically expect. There was an eerie quietness around the nearly empty hallways. Patients were in their rooms, devoid of family members. You could not see whole faces with everyone wearing masks, so one had to try very hard to recognize others through anxious eyes. It was difficult not to share the anxiety and even feel a dose of fear in the midst of it all. Most of the patients were in terrible health, uh, health conditions, anxious, disorganized, confused, agitated, and gasping for air. It became very clear that the majority of them could not be treated via telepsychiatry. But if we were to do so, someone would have to handle um, the communications directly with the patient. The first time I went to the unit, the team 
the team was responding to an emergency and performing CPR. I had right at this moment, I surrendered to the circumstances. When in my life, I had convinced myself that I wanted to serve as a doctor. My natural fight or flight response, I chose to fight. Um, nervousness, nervousness, worries, and sadness did overwhelm me at times. The first weeks were especially challenging. I found myself conflicted, wanting to help and longing to be home with my daughter and my husband instead of the hospital. The fear of infecting them became real, especially, especially as colleagues and staff members were falling ill. It was impossible not to be affected, witnessing many patients dying while isolated from their loved ones and the anguish experienced by families. Thankfully, over the following weeks, concerns over PPE shortages were addressed, giving us a greater sense of protection. We got more organized. Things were a little less tense. I found myself following the same recommendations I usually give my patients. While helping me most during this crisis was the support of family and friends, finding a way to socially be close, even while physically distant, constant video reunions, peer support, mindfulness exercises, awareness of one's thoughts and emotions, and challenging any inaccurate thinking were all useful. This crisis has made us witness, witnesses to raw emotion. Some reacted with willingness to help others while others show an acute sense of preservation. These reactions are reasonable, and I believe I had both. There were some, there's been so much sadness and loss, but people have also come with their best. Organization adaptability has given us PPE, equipment, and systems to require cri uh, management of cri for management of crisis in some places. Healers have been able to help other healers. And for those of us in Queens, um, a community that is not affluent in resources, we saw the richness of spirits and endless gestures of kindness towards those of us in Helmers, reminding us that gratitude is priceless and serving is privilege. So I'm, I'm going to leave that, and I've, I've mentioned a few concepts there that probably resonate with so many of you. Um, and and I, I'm going to uh, allow our panelists to take us through their experiences and, and their, the solutions that they've, they've tried to bring forth. And I would love for us to start thinking about the questions and, and, and concepts that, uh, that you want to uh, bring forth and also with uh, the comments and solutions at some point that you brought yourselves uh, so that we have the opportunity to truly sh uh, share with each other. Um, on that note, uh, I would really love to I welcome Dr. Jant from India. He's a maxillofacial surgeon uh, in Wheaton, Bangalore, uh, director of uh, and medical supervisor at ABMSS, uh, supporting 36 cleft centers across India um, in collaboration with the CKH. Um, he's very well published and accomplished and uh, probably one of the nicest human beings that you get a chance to, to talk to. He's, when, you, when you engage with Jan, you can immediately see uh, a level of humanity and affability and approachability that you would hope from any of the of the people who take care of yourself or your children. Uh, so, Jan, uh, the floor is yours. Welcome and thank you for being here. Thanks, Ruben. Uh, thanks for the kind words and uh, the wonderful message that you uh, set the ball rolling. Um, I uh, am really humbled by the kind words, Ruben. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, one and all. Greetings to you all from Bangalore, India. At the outset, I would like to thank Tia for organizing this unique symposium and for allowing me to share my experience. Uh, next. I'm Dr. Jayanth here. I'm a maxillofacial surgeon and I work out of this General Hospital Rangadore Memorial where I uh, run the ABMS's Bangalore Cleft Center. Uh, I am part of uh, this ABMS's family, which is a non-profit based out of Bangalore, which in turn is an Indian affiliate of the Deutsche Cleft Kinder Hilfe based out of Freiburg, Germany. And we uh, support 36 comprehensive cleft centers uh, with all of them performing the entire spectrum of cleft surgeries. Next. 
Uh, we are uh, delighted that we are uh, we have partnered with Transforming Faces uh, for the comprehensive care services in India, and uh, CCC forms the bedrock of our relationship with them. Just like uh, all of you across the globe, uh, we too had a major disruption during the months of April and May with zero work and some partial return to work in the months uh, following that. Now we are back to 50% of our capacity, but still we are not out of the woods. And as of now, we provide services both in person and virtually. Next. It's been a very emotional, uncertain period for me personally, managing the team and convincing partners, my colleagues, partners meaning the hospital and also the patients. And the key challenges here lies in uh, lack of motivation uh, uh, concerning uh, the nature of the charitable work with higher risk reward ratio, the fear of getting infected at work driven by the media hype, the logistical ch challenges of traveling to the workplace, working with a PP, the restricted working hours with all the protocols. Uh, we, we did learn from uh, immensely, I would say, from the European and the American centers who were ahead of the curve. We all attended online webinars, researched the literature, uh, also looked up to the guidelines by our own professional bodies, and then we set up virtual meetings. And it was the team, uh, collectively the team uh, took up the uh, the cohesive as a cohesive unit we discussed the challenges before us and came out with a protocol next next yes yeah and uh, once we had uh, the recommendations or the protocol set up by the team uh, i'm sure uh, this is a list uh, which um, more or less we have been able to implement it consisted of uh, a hospital triage for most of the patients coming in, especially following a telephonic care model, wherein the patients were screened for symptoms and then we take them in for any care. Uh, we did reassure all the team members. Uh, we topped up their COVID health insurance. Uh, we have been regularly doing health checkups for the team members and testing them on a regular basis. Uh, we took up training for the team and uh, we have recommended some meditation app. And we also follow the social bubble concept wherein 50% uh, of the staff work on alternative weeks. And we have supplied the basic uh, needs of PPE, the respirator, the face shield, so on and so forth. And our work has uh, been based out of uh, only doing the essential care while we have suspended the non-essential. Uh, that we uh, do this um, uh, after we take the COVID consenting and declaration from both the patients and the team members, of course. Next. Uh, as of now, our model of care uh, revolves around doing only the essential. So what I mean by that is we have stopped the common clinics where the patients would walk in and get to see all the consultants uh, being there at the same time. Uh, to prevent overcrowding and mingling of the crowd, we have ensured that uh, the uh, cleft children, they come in and the pediatrician comes to the cleft unit and uh, does the screening for them, be it the nutritional care or uh, any pre-surgical fitness is carried out at the unit. We've also modified our uh, NAM protocols. We are just uh, strapping up and uh, uh, putting the nasal hook as you can see the picture, and uh, we have trained parents. Uh, we are quite uh, happy with the way things have uh, turned around, and we virtually monitor this uh, with, without the patients coming there with the tiny toddlers. And uh, so, so has been uh, the case with speech therapy, which uh, of course has increased the footfalls, the compliance is better, and the speech therapy is something that's been very successful for us. Uh, we have increased the frequency of ortho clinics uh, just to space out the patients and restricted the dental care to emergency. Next. Uh, so has been the case with ENT with only symptomatic patients trickling in one here, one there with an ear pain. Uh, we have ensured minimal waiting period for all patients with uh, no patient seeing the back of the other. And as far as surgery goes, uh, surgery has been restricted to only the primary uh, surgery, either the lip or the palate, uh, that to without us soliciting the patients from getting in. 
uh, the patients have to come up, come up voluntarily asking for the surgery. This is what we have learned during the pandemic. And a new normal way of running the cleft camps has been to make public announcements and distribute pamphlets with WhatsApp number. And the patients actually call us up and we do a virtual screening over the WhatsApp and then get them into the hospital. Next. Uh, the, the, with regards to the team, we uh, meet up very regularly and uh, we access shared digital files and we have a WhatsApp common chat group for patient care. So far, all things have been good, but however, there are a few challenges with home-based therapy like parents have to be around, the availability of smartphones, the uh, issue with network, uh, the increased screen time for the uh, children, non-availability of smartphones, of course, and stalled outreach programs, and logistical issues uh, like traveling from uh, beyond a certain distance because the transportation is still not back into full scope. Next. Some of the uh, tips that I would recommend uh, to my friends across the globe would be to chill out, eat and sleep well, exercise regularly, take breaks from screen, and take your hobbies seriously to keep yourself engaged. Uh, at the end of uh, the day, have a five minute debrief on a daily basis while you catalog what you learned and revise your plan from time to time. And uh, uh, don't let your guard down, follow uh, OMEN rather, uh, it's an acronym for wash your hands, obey social distancing, mask up, exercise, and no unnecessary traveling while you avoid uh, touching the mouth, eyes, and the nose. Undergo periodic health checkups and quarantine when needed. Next. And uh, the most important message that I would like to give is stand up uh, to your profession. This is the time that we provide service above self while delivering maximum essential care. That's what I would like to stress on. And the lessons that I would uh, want to share most importantly is heed to your team advice, have regular meetings and adapt as per the need of the hour, prioritize your own mental and physical health and be open to any new suggestions that come in. It could be online therapy or when you again go through a second peak, stop your services for a while, so on and so forth. And who knows, due to the pandemic, the next step could be a entirely tertiary care cleft center with focus on safety with our cleft community not mingling with the general crowd. Finally, I would like to end my presentation with a, a terrific metaphor for what can happen to us. Look at the picture here. This is the uh, Choloteca Bridge and what an engineering marvel it was when it was constructed. But the, uh, the forces of nature destroyed everything around it. The river is diverted and we just have a bridge over nothing, bridge to nothing. And uh, so, so is this relevant to us today? The world is changing in ways we have never imagined. And uh, what was built to last, uh, we, we need to adapt. I think we need to uh, be built to adapt because an illiterate of the 21st century is not somebody who fails to read or write, but is somebody who fails to unlearn, relearn, and learn. So friends, with this, uh, this crisis has given us a window of opportunity. Let's have a heart bigger than our size and do what best we can. Thank you very much. John, th thank you so much for, for your presentation. And there's so many concepts to start pulling out of that. I, I actually do love uh, the fact that it seems like you obviously place some great emphasis on, on on, on communication and team input. Those are concepts that should be ongoing in any, in any case uh, as we care for others. Um, they focus on self-care, they focus on caring for, uh, for each other uh, and, and supporting each other. And, and definitely the, the, the concept of um, the build to adapt rather than the build to last because we, we don't want to bridge nowhere, we want to bridge into the future. Um, thank you very much. And we'll, we'll come back to you, Jan. Um, so I, I have to say I have not had the privilege of meeting Dr. Carmen Morovic personally, but I, I would say, Carmen, that your reputation precedes you. And, and, and I have heard nothing but very positive things. Outside of you, in a club surgeon in Chile and the head, head of the plastic surgery unit uh, at the Luis Calvo McKenna Children's Hospital, uh, you're, you're a member of the Fundacion GANS, which is 
hugely known, well known, extremely well known and respected, uh, a member um, and a partner of, of Smile Train, which with whom you, you've done a significant amount of work, uh, and you're a teacher. So I, um, so, such appreciation and respect for people like you. I, I went into a couple of uh, resources and I found, uh, and if anybody ever wants to uh, find it, a a great interview by uh, Revista Caras. Uh, when you talk about the gratifying task of offering reconstructed children, uh, surgery to children, and, uh, and in a very inspired way. And it, it, it shares uh, with people who may not have had the pleasure of meeting you personally, um, that one and that commitment to, to the profession and to, to the children we serve. So I would love to welcome you and ask for you to share uh, your insight in how uh, you um, and your team were able to take care of each other or have been able to put some uh, Processes to take care of each other in this time. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you very much for your warm uh, introduction. Well, um, at first, uh, I work in a pediatric hospital in Santiago de Chile and also Fundación Gans and private practice. And I will share with you what are we doing in, in this critical time? Uh, and I can say that it's the same in the private and in the public. So next, I don't, please. Next. Next. Uh, no, before, before, before. <laughs> yes. Since I am not an expert um, in COVID infection, I just can share with you our own practical experience in Chile, dealing with the pandemic during our professional task. The common sense gives us a dimension of the involved risk. So how to solve our, or, or aminorate such potential risk? We believe that it's creating protocols. Next. Our first protocols during the most critical, during the, the most critical period of a pandemic in Chile, uh, we do not carry out any kind of elective surgery or presential clinical control of patients. We have done just telemedicine. After that, once the peak of the cases decreases as a tendency, around one month ago, we progressively restarted the elective surgery, but just in healthy patients without comorbidity and prioritizing primary cleft surgeries. Um, at a tone, in, a tone in this slide, there are some general and basic preventive measures or protocol that must be followed by everyone everywhere, like uh, keep distance, wear your mask, wash your hands frequently, as all the, the, the people here have shown. But ob obviously in our activity and due to the involvement, the involvement risk, we need more radical rules. Next. Uh, how we are allowed to perform surgery, considering the potential risk of infection involved in a surgery, it is possible to do it, but following safety protocols, those protocols involve both medical team and patients. Next. Related to the patient, at first the patient must be in quarantine during one week previously to the surgery. Second rule is the patient must answer a questionnaire looking for symptoms or situation of potential infection. And at first, the patient must take a PCR COVID exam 24 or 48 hours before the surgery with negative results. This is the pre-surgical questionnaire where uh, in the items one, one to the next, please. In this uh, pre-surgical questionnaire, items one to 10, 
1 to 10, are referred to symptom of COVID. And then item 11 to 17, look for possible infection due to the interaction with some other people. So the contacts. Next. If all the answers are negative, we have green light for surgery. But if there is one or more affirmative response, surgery must be canceled. In that case, the patient could not be considered for the surgery until 14 days later, or after improved the adverse condition and would be submitted to the same safe protocol. So after, after 14 days, we can repeat the, um, the questionnaire and if all the answer are, are negative, we can do the surgery. If not, we have to wait again. Next. Related to the team, by default, health personnel symptoms are checked daily. In the event of any suspect isolation and PCR examination is performed. Depending on the result, the rules detected by the health authority are applying a monitoring of positive cases. All team members must permanently wear masks. The additional personal protection elements are used according to the protocols established by the health authority, depending on the work that they perform. Next. This is me. <laughs> the personal protection elements for surgery include mask can uh, 95 plus running mask eye protector glass, glasses or loops in, in my case and we have to add the facial mask next at the operating room we must first Restrict the unnecessary circulation, and second, avoid unnecessary delay with respect to the regular time of surgery. Uh, if you think this is very uh, bad for teaching purpose, so um, in that case, next. So we said, um, what happened with the teaching activity? Being constrained by the two side restriction, we figured out a simple but proficient way for teaching to the resident. And it was to record each procedure at the OR using the popular GoPro camera. Next. The conclusion of this study will be published by the British Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery comparing three different intraoral views depending on the position of the camera. Especially when we are doing intraoral uh, surgery like a palate surgery or palate repair. Next. In the first condition was intraoral surgery recording with a GoPro Hero 7 black camera used with a hair strap by the first surgeon. And this was the position that we have the better view. Next. Um, the second condition, like this, the GoPro was used with the hair strap by the first assistant. And the third condition, the GoPro hand was handheld by the assistant. Based upon the imaging, we conclude with no doubt the best intraoral view has been captured with the GoPro handheld by the system. So we believe that this is a good um, idea how to teach in this, in this condition of coronavirus time. So we believe that we have to learn how to live and do our work with coronavirus until the vaccine is coming. Thank you very much.
Thank you very, very much, Carmen, uh, for the wonderful presentation. And right away, we see a couple of things that are very critical, right? So we, we're talking about taking care of ourselves and the, and the teams during this COVID. And, and we're all doing that in, in context of not sitting idle, but actually trying to do uh, uh, what, we, what, we, what we're set up to do for patients. And so there's a, a significant technical aspect in, in taking care of each other, um, which has to be uh, performed in sync with looking at uh, the mental health. So you, you can't talk about the mental health of someone if you really don't have the basic PPE requirements to perform the work. Um, and you, when you talk about examples like the, the training of residents, there's an adaptability aspect that uh, Jan mentioned before. They are part of the, the club teams and we're committed to their training and, 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 and the future uh, with some of them. So how do we protect them in a matter that doesn't take away their ability to still prepare uh, to, to be leaders for, for club care in the future as well? So thank you very, very much for, for this. We're going to come back and ask more questions. I'm sure this has brought a lot of, a lot of uh, thoughts from, from every single member of the audience. Um, but thank you very much, Carmen, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I really have a, also the pleasure of introducing Dr. Opoku Ampoma, um, who is the director of the National Reconstructive Plastic Surgery and Burn Center at Kolebu Teaching Hospital. He actually is now has been appointed by the president to be the director of the entire hospital in, in, in Accra, Ghana. Um, I've, I've had the privilege of knowing Dr. Opoku uh, as, as, a, as a provider, as a just fantastic human being, and as a friend. And I, I'm, I'm, a, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to not be a little bit starstruck. Um, he's, he's really smart and committed and, and very flexible and humble. Uh, I, I do have a situation a few years ago where we were reviewing a system of, of review of outcomes, and I asked him in front of everybody if he would be willing to sort of share his outcomes without him knowing what those were at that time. And, he was willing to, and you know his outcomes were fantastic. So it was a sigh of relief. Uh, but it shows that he he's, he has that willingness to, that humility to put that himself out there to, uh, for others to look at his work. Um, anyway, he's, a, he's just an exemplary human being that I uh, have the privilege of introducing today. And uh, Opoku, thank you for being with us. I appreciate you sharing your insight and experience. Um, thank you, everyone. It's Lovely to be in the midst of such great company. And uh, thank you for your kind words, Ruben. Um, I'm, I work in uh, a National Reconstructive Plastic Surgery and Bend Center, which is the main hospital in Ghana that provides uh, care for patients who need uh, reconstructive plastic surgery, including clefts. In fact, uh, uh, about some years ago, we used for a 10 year period, we, we did. Uh, work with uh, transforming faces worldwide, and so that's for a period of about ten years. So they, they were uh, kind of supporting comprehensive cleft care in my center. So we are quite familiar with uh, them, and it was it was under their sponsorship that I got to uh, uh, travel to Chile, where I met the wonderful Carmen and and uh, and, and uh, Meta and some of the other uh, lovely people in Chile uh, with working for the young guns and uh, the children's hospital. So um, it, it, I feel like this is a, like a family reunion. And so uh, look forward to sharing some of our ideas. Um, well, this pandemic, as you all are aware, next slide, please. And this, this pandemic, as you all are aware, uh, took everybody by surprise. Although we in Africa were one of the last places to see significant cases. But Ghana had our first documented case is in the middle of March. But because of what was happening in Europe and uh, in Asia, you know, there was a lot of fear because uh, you are, as you may all be aware, our health systems are not as robust as uh, in the more advanced countries. In fact, on a normal day, we still struggle with basic, providing basic uh, care to our patients. And uh, if you take some like intensive care unit beds, and for the entire country, the population of about 30 million, they are just around about uh, a little under 100 intensive care beds in the whole country. So, and in terms of intensive care specialists, uh, th those are uh, very rare commodities. So, when this pandemic was coming, uh, there were 
many uh, prophets of doom who predicted, predicted that will be totally annihilated you know by the pandemic but as it were we had to do what we had to do so um in terms of preparation once the cases hit we had to uh, cancel our planned uh, uh you know out we, we 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 run a mission based program with operation smile both local and international missions and uh, we also do a regular follow up for our patients around the country and so we had to put these programs on hold because we weren't sure how things were going to go. And uh, this, and then um, we now reduced uh, cases to urgent elective uh, cases. And this was also quite a challenge because although my hospital is a government hospital, we do not receive any funds from government to sustain the services. Government only pays the salaries of the staff. And then we have to be able to look at uh, fund everything else from the service that we render. So once there's any cut or restriction in the service we provide, then it's going to actually affect our output significantly. But it was a decision we had to take in the interest of uh, 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 safety for the staff and the patients. Next slide, please. And so the main challenges were availability of PPEs, but uh, and uh, the cost of PPEs just shot through the roof. We used to buy a box of 50 surgical masks for about three US dollars. And during the pandemic, it shot to as high as about 70 US dollars and even higher than that. So, I mean, very, very few people, I mean, very few institutions are prepared to uh, take up that kind of cost. Also, there's a lot of anxiety because many of our staff were not prepared to deal with uh, this. And because of the high death rate that we're hearing among, and uh, health workers in other countries, there was a lot of fear and anxiety. In fact, in my hospital, we're in the news for the bad reason, and that uh, there was a, a case, suspected case of uh, coronavirus that appeared in the, you know, uh, in the hospital at the beginning of March, and a lot of the staff in the emergency room just uh, disappeared. They, 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 they voted with their feet. And so uh, you can imagine the level of anxiety that was, uh, you know, occasioning this kind of event. So we had to undertake uh, a lot of public, I mean, education, training for the staff, you know. And uh, the other issue also was the poor public education and public perception. In fact, when this whole thing started, many uh, persons, including very senior people in government, uh, actually came out publicly say that, well, they didn't think that the coronavirus was going to uh, affect us in Africa because of uh, you know the high ambient uh, temperature, and uh, you know so, and 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 so they thought that this was a foreign disease. This was something that will, would affect only uh, uh, foreign lands, and so many of the local people felt that they have not travelled abroad before, so they don't see how come they would they could possibly be affected by this uh, condition. So it made compliance with some of the safety measures a bit a bit difficult, and then the issue also was availability of testing and long delay in getting results. So many of the, uh, and there was only one main test center in Accra, which is the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research that was undertaking COVID-19 testing at that time. And uh, there was also a smaller unit also in the second largest city in Ghana. So all the samples needed to be run through this uh, single uh, facility. And so it caused a lot of delay uh, in obtaining results. Next slide. So, and uh, what could we do? So we, uh, in the, in the, with, that, with that background, we tried to uh, show up the gap in uh, PPEs by working for our partners. So Patient Smart was very uh, uh, helpful uh, in this, that we, we were able to, uh, you know, get some support from Patient Smart using some of the stuff, the cargo that we we're going to use for our missions. We made this available to the hospitals that uh, our personal hospitals around the country. And so we went around donating um, both PPEs and uh, equipment like monitors, et cetera, uh, to some of these hospitals and to the Ministry of Health. We also set up staff support system to try to ensure strict adherence to COVID-19 protocols. In fact, uh, during the uh, early days uh, where there was controversy as to whether to wear a mask or not, uh, for, so, uh, my, my, for my department, we took a bold decision and to make masks wearing universal, although there were still people who were saying that maybe it was not, uh, whether it was aerosol born or all that, we decided that look, we're on the side of safety. So we made that universal, uh, you know, across board. 
And so we had uh, mechanisms, uh, you know, to ensure that every member gets staff. So we made sure we invested heavily in getting, uh, you know, PP, adequate PPEs for staff. Everybody screened before they enter the facility. Uh, you know, work uh, schedules were realigned, created teams so that people would, uh, so that we don't get cross infections and also communication lines and uh, all staff were to report their symptoms on a daily basis uh, to one coordinator. And if there's anybody who was suspected of having COVID-19, then that, that was flagged immediately and I was made, I was kept in the loop, made aware so that we could, um, you know, decide what to do for that person. Next slide, please. Of course, uh, you, you cannot pour from an empty cup, so we need to take off ourselves. So I have to lead by example, so making sure that I was always in my mask, always and uh, trying to uh, show hand washing and all that. So I had to be an ambassador and for that because uh, in our environment, it was very quite difficult to, uh, you know, get people used to this new normal. And so I had to uh, kind of, you know, demonstrate in a, a very actively and also try and balance uh, reading uplifting material because it felt like Doomsday was coming, and, you know, you know, because of all the media hype that was created around it, and of course, and uh, like one of the earlier speakers said, everybody was talking about the number of deaths, you know. So as, as soon as the deaths started coming in, you know, that was all the, that we were hearing about the media. So uh, people were become very pessimistic, but we had to stay positive, stay connected, and uh, the, the, the 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 you know the silver lining was that we using the virtual platforms, we were able to actually be now hold more meetings. Uh, attend more webinars, you know, do things that uh, would improve uh, the, 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 our knowledge and our understanding. So, and uh, next slide, please. So, and uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, the, in the rest of the operations of volunteers around the country, we make sure that we, uh, we had virtual meetings. We had a WhatsApp group, you know, where we kept each other up to date, checking on each other, you know, and, uh, and in fact, I can say that so far for, my uh, staff of about 200 my units, we had only two cases, but the two cases were people who came and who were rotated into my units from other units. And so uh, because of the strict protocols we had put in place, uh, no other persons were uh, affected. But um, now the case numbers in Ghana are going down. We have under, now only have under 500 active cases at the moment. And so people are beginning to relax. And so there's a fear that we may get a second wave. So next slide. So the takeaway is that um, um, we must learn to uh, turn off fear into constructive action. And no matter how bad things appear, you know, a, a positive attitude will always get us through. And then we should learn not to let what we cannot do interfere with what we can do. Uh, there was a lot of things going around the country, but I will look at what we can do within our unit, within our, our, our facility, and try to achieve that. And then uh, eternal vigilance, this is not the time to let our guard down, we must always keep and maintain uh, active business against the infection. And then uh, let's not also be afraid to go against popular opinion. At the time that we decided to, um, you know, enforce a universal wearing of masks, because tests were not regularly available, we decided to treat everybody as a potential COVID-19 patient so that uh, we could keep safe. So in fact, uh, our facility has been lucky to have very, uh, you know, just only two people who have got infected for us. There will be outbreaks in other departments in the hospital. And of course, team communication is important. And uh, as a leader, uh, I've learned that you shouldn't ask people to do what you are not ready to do yourself. So I had to uh, uh, walk the talk and make sure that I, 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 I don't, I, you know, I, I stay at the front in terms of taking care of potential COVID-19 patients, uh, counseling, uh, you know, patients, and then uh, helping to uh, organize the services. At the moment, what we are looking at doing to restart um, the, the service is to uh, try and, uh, uh, you know, bring patients in batches, uh, you know, who will be appropriately screened so that we can do them in batches and uh, within the unit. So that hopefully will start the next month. Next slide. Thank you very much for attention. Okay, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation as always. and and. and so everybody, well, here we have it. We've had the opportunity to listen to three fantastic panelists who are coming from different parts of the world. Uh, we're exposed to different challenges and contexts and, and some of the same challenges and contexts uh, as, as well. You know, we're not so different from each other. Sometimes it, it just is about the infrastructure or the resources that we have. Sometimes it, 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 
is dealing with the challenges that are beyond the, the hospital environment. But um, I believe they've given us a good um, sort of one wrong way to have some additional discussions and, and, and this question and answer session. Uh, and I do hope you can, you can um, uh, participate, participate actively. I, you know, I, they've taken us through the journey of a, an, an, an original reaction to a, 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 an emergency, uh, sort of the regional thinking around our response, the organization around the things that can and should be done uh, for the protection of, of our teams, the considerations around um, the ability to, to return to caring for our patients, um, and, and the, the thoughtfulness that's required to make sure that as we do that, we're considered of the enormous pressures that our teams and, the and our patients and the families are, our patients are, are, are potentially exposed to, all um, you know, with, with a great dose of gracious uh, and um, formative sort of leadership and, and a look into a bridge to adaptability into the future. So uh, thank you to, to this one, to, to Apoco and Carmen and, and Jenna and for, for the, their insight. Um, Abdon, I think we have a, a few questions, but um, yes. maybe- uh, Before you go with the questions, Ruben, just want to mention that uh, please keep the viewer video switch on. So we are interacting as Opoku said, we're a family here. So don't be shy. Okay. And uh, um, if you want to participate, if you have a question or comment, please put it in the chat so Ruben can take it up from there. Okay. Um, sounds great. Uh, Adon. So there were a few questions that we had to get us started. I don't know if we can project those. Uh, I'm done. Uh, but if not, well, well, you do that, uh, I, I might have a few uh, to get us going. Okay. So um, to, to the three of the panelists, so it, it's been said that supporting the mental health of medical staff and affiliated healthcare workers is a critical part of a public health response. Did you feel like you have, do you feel like you have received support from the health system? And, and what are the key things um, that you had to do if you were in a situation of having to find a way, a way yourself. You've alluded to some of this already, but you know, what are sort of the key things that you would point uh, to any of us who are in a situation where the public health response has, has been there, but not necessarily addressing the needs of our teams and our patients? And I'll, I'll leave it open to, to, to our three panelists. Yeah, so uh, I think Ruben, the question, if I understand correctly, is to do with uh, psychological support for team members. Is, is that... Yeah, and, and actually, I, I apologize. I, I would actually say both psychological and actually the, the, the technical support that's required. The health system is supposed yes. to have a process and a leadership yeah. that supports you. And yes. if you got it, great. And if you didn't, what are the key things you you felt that needed to be addressed? Yes, in fact, um, yes. Uh, uh, in my part of the world, uh, in fact, especially in, in my hospital, my hospital happens to be the largest uh, hospital in the entire country, the main referral center for patients from across the country. And unfortunately, uh, when this crisis hit, uh, the, you know, the hospital did not show the kind of leadership that I was expecting it to show. And in fact, uh, what happened that there was, among the management at that time, there was very poor, communication with staff so so in that situation then uh, some of us as department heads had to uh, do what we could within the, the, the you know the situation because uh, everybody was focused there was a lot of fear anxiety and panic all over the place and then of course uh, basic things like providing ppes etc were not forthcoming so i um what I did was to engage the private sector. I also went to what happened also to be the country medical director of Operation Smile. So I spoke to my colleagues and said, well, uh, we have all these PPs that we were going to use for uh, you know, our forthcoming artists. So is it possible to speak to headquarters and have them uh, reissued you know, so that we can support the facilities that we, 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 you know, we pass now with? So those are the kind of things that happened. So engaging private sector, and players to come in, etc. So those were, those were uh, on the kind of the logistics side, so that the staff felt that they were adequately being taken care of. Although it was a responsibility of the Ministry of Health to do this, but once that was failing, we couldn't just sit 
and, and you know, and fiddle with our hands because we had to take it. So that was one of the things that we did. And then the next thing was also to make sure that we were communicating regularly. So we set up Zoom meetings and WhatsApp groups within the, uh, you know, the team and to make sure that we're passing information regularly. And then uh, staff were, were sure that if they felt any symptoms or whatever, you know, they should own up immediately and they will be taken care of and no, no stigmatization and what whatsoever. And then uh, in terms of even uh, testing, for instance, a few times we had cases where they needed to be tested. There, there was a system, so-called system in place and also to get people tested, but this system was not working. I mean, sometimes suspected cases come in and it takes over a week for them to get tested. So I had to find my own way around it to bypass the system and get direct access so that uh, when it came to my staff and it came to patients from our center, we could get the testing done within 24, 48 hours and know the results so that we can move on. So these were sort of extra things that one had to take on. And then of course, uh, I engaged the, uh, the help of the psychologist who is working in the team to cancel. So there were a few people that had to stay out of home because they had a common code or they're not sure whether uh, you know, or, or pre-testing, you know, we had made sure that everybody, before they were tested, they, they were cancelled, pre-testing, and then whilst they were waiting the results, which we tried to keep as short as possible to do 24 to 48 hours, and they were they got some kind of support. I'll call them personally and talk to them and that kind of thing and try to, uh, you know, encourage them as much as possible. So we tried to keep a, a sense of family, a sense of community, you know, uh, you know, going so that, uh, uh, you know, people didn't feel like they were abandoned. Because one of the things in this part of the world is that uh, there's very poor compensation for healthcare workers. And so many people felt that uh, if this getting COVID meant a death sentence, then what were they going to leave behind for their families? You know, so I did write, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I wrote a number of proposition, proposals to uh, the seat of government, uh, you know, about some of these things and the steps I thought they needed to do. So uh, on the back of that, the Institute an insurance uh, policy to cover all frontline, you know, all health workers, and, and you know, so this was quite a good uh, thing, and so so for those who got infected, they have the compensation package, and then for those who, if unfortunately anybody died, they will also get a compensation package for their family. So at least this help to reassure, uh, you know, people, you know, the health workers, and reduce, and then of course we also had to educate them, you know, uh, that look. It's possible to work with COVID. It's, the COVID is just like any other infection. And if you take the right precautions, you're not going to get uh, you know, infected or you can avoid it. Interesting. So so there's, a lot there's a lot there. I mean, you, you yeah. brought a, you, you, you've taken us through the, the, the reaction towards acquisition of PPE all the way yeah. to thinking about it, compensation packages in, in, in yeah. case of a tragedy and as yeah. part of the response. Um, Carmen, you know, Chile is, is, is a high income country, you know, and we, we see that you, you, you've been able to restart work. Um, did you find some of the challenges that Bokun Jayan might have mentioned in terms of access to, to resources, PPE, uh, testing, mental health, uh, support, or, or, or have you found more, more that, that those, those resources are, are much more accessible to you in the context where you work? And I think you're muted. Uh, Carmen, you need no, to un no, 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 no. Okay. Well, I think uh, we are very uh, fortunate because we have EBP enough in everywhere, in public and private practice. So I believe that our problem is not the disponibility of the EPP is the hysterical collective hysterical uh, situation because um, we I I believe that we are most most exposed uh, because we are trying patient we go to the hospital we now operate on patients, but if we take the um, appropriate, uh, uh, if we take the appropriate uh, um, EPP and um, 
the, the, the rules, we follow the rules of the health authority, I think we are, we are okay. The problem is when you are out of the hospital, when you have to go to the supermarket, when you have to go to, the, to, to other, other places where people, uh, many of them don't follow the rules. So they, they are not with masks, they are not uh, uh, take care uh, when they are with cough, etc. Et so we believe that we are more conscious in the hospital than outside. Um, in, in our specific case, I work in a pediatric hospital, so we don't have too many cases of COVID adult uh, patients. But uh, in our case, the anesthesiologist, for example, and the anesthesia machine were sent to an adult center. So in our case, uh, we have less uh, sources professional sources um, when we start to to do surgery um, was just when the cases were decreased in the country because the anesthesiologists and all of those things uh, were back to the hospital so um, I believe that the the medias the TV and all of those things are very um, important how to con how to to say the the news of the of the of the illness. Carmen, it's really interesting what you're mentioning because even in the face of resources, because in Chile you have resources to to adapt to conditions and offer supplies. You're talking about a mass hysteria, which which creates a collective sense of anxiety and affects the, the health of, of providers of rural populations. To that you add the disappointment that as cell providers we might have with the fact that we're trying to do everything to take care of each other and to take care of people and people not actually taking the similar measures to cooperate in that response. There's no, there's no uh, secret that here in the United, for those of us who are in the United States, we have absolutely botched the public health response. So, so I, I I, I empathize significantly with what, what you're sharing. And on top of that, there's another source I've, I've seen a, a comment from Marina, uh, who's saying, yes. that, talking about the cost, you know, so you might have access to all, all, all these resources, but there's still a high cost, which makes it really difficult to have access potentially, uh, and to continue to provide that level of protection that, that's required. So certainly even in the high income countries, there are a lot of challenges. Jan, I, I would love to ask for your insight, because now you've heard of Poku and, and Carmen, um, you know, come and share your experiences from different points of view. Um, would you have anything to add from either following their, 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 thoughts, their, their thoughts or, or some of your, your own experience? Uh, well, um, as far as uh, my experience goes, I would uh, give you a live example. Now, we started out uh, sometime in the month of uh, May, during the lockdown, uh, there were many uh, uh, children who were referred out to us, five-day-old, eight-day-old, ten-day-old children. And uh, I had to start off uh, accepting the babies. One was for evaluation and uh, with regards to the modified NAM approach that uh, we had to set out with. Now, uh, one of the child actually turned out to be positive. Around the fourth week of NAM, the, uh, the modified NAM consisted of just two visits, initial visit. The first visit was to teach and train the parents on strapping. And the second visit was to ensure that there were no rashes and to put up the nasal uh, prongs. Now, once that was done, it was virtually um, checking up to, with the parents on a regular basis twice a week and just to ensure that things were going fine. Now, uh, the child actually had contracted COVID from the grandmother and the child had visited us in the unit. And suddenly, uh, all the team members uh, 
went into a tizzy. In fact, uh, they were quite uh, <coughs> surprised uh, and shocked that uh, a small child uh, turned out to be positive. And though they were all with the uh, protective gas, nothing is foolproof. And uh, most of them uh, went into a period of quarantine for 10 days. And uh, uh, we, we just uh, uh, were keeping our fingers crossed why we ensured that the child recovered. So this was a phase for most of us wherein we not just uh, hoped that the child recovered, but also ensured that none of us turned positive. We were checking on each other and ensuring that uh, none of us uh, turned up with any symptoms. Luckily, though the child had spent uh, 15 to 20 minutes with us, with most of the team members, none of them turned positive. So this was uh, an eye opener for the entire team. And uh, coming back to the uh, question that you had posed about mental health. Now, in our country, in India, most of us uh, actually grow up with uh, a bit of spirituality. We all uh, actually have some yoga classes. We have uh, uh, some uh, meditation priors and things like that, which actually starts off from our uh, childhood. And uh, sometimes it gets into the schooling also, mainly the yoga. And therefore, uh, it is something that uh, we, we tend to have uh, more of mental resilience when it comes to that. And uh, being uh, a slightly warmer country, I always believe that uh, having uh, the sun out on most days of the year actually gives you a lot of hope, the bright sunshine. And um, that actually uh, contributed a lot to the positive thinking uh, of the entire team. And uh, a few of the doctors in the hospital did uh, start an evening uh, uh, prior session wherein we chanted from our Vedas and so on and so forth. So, but we, we were not part of it. Uh, th this was circulated well in the group, which meant that it was up to the individuals and the doctors to look into their own mental health and uh, physical health. The hospital uh, did not actually provide any means of doing it because they were grappling with the situation with the government taking over part of the hospital for COVID care. So th this is my experience so far with it. And the fear was just during the initial phase of it, I would like to give the analogy of the uh, the river Mara. It was uh, just like how all of us have seen the herd of zebras wanting to cross over the river Mara. Uh, it was, uh, uh, the initial phase was for a few of the doctors to get going on the clinical work. And when we saw that most of the doctors got across into the depth of the river Mara, here it was COVID, and we all opened up. We all opened up wanting to cross across. And now life is back to normal. Life is back to normal and most of us are, uh, doing our clinical work without any fear. Interesting. Uh, yeah, no, they, and uh, let me just go back. Uh, there's a few other comments on the chat that are really interesting. So uh, you know, Karen has actually highlighted the fact that there are concerns around health, there are concerns around mental health, uh, physical health, mental health. And also there's other concerns and societies um, because this situation has added to poverty and lack of access and, and a whole bunch of, of Sense. So we might have our teams, our, our own teams might actually be worried about their own uh, livelihoods and, and positions and, and, and dealing with things at home that, that might be unbeknownst to us. So, so I, I love, you know, Behan says she loves the idea of the, the, the mental resilience, which is something that we can all learn from. Um, so there are a couple of questions. So Tingle, you raised your hand. I would love to take these last 12 minutes. And I'd love to hear points of view from all of you. Uh, who are here of, of things that you wish to share from your experience that have been useful to you. Uh, and also, Behan had a question on how you are addressing, obviously, the concern that parents really want their kids to be taken care of. So what is the reliability of, of the questioner um, in terms of the true prevention? Right? Because if you're a dad, you, you know, we're in those situations. I mean, you, you, you hope that that isn't the case. But So addressing that, but also I would really love to hear from all of you in some things that you wish to share that you that have been useful to you and your teams. Thank you, Ting. I understood that. So she's at, Ting, Ting is asking about whether the government was able to intervene 
the, in stopping the price gouging that that you and not, not not directly actually I, I i was one of the people in one of the paper that i wrote to the government i I, I, I did stress on that on that 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 actually needed to be taken against uh, price gouging, but uh, it was done indirectly in the sense that what they did was that they got together some industrialists got together and quickly started producing some of the PPs locally, and and you know in large quantities. So that kind of helped to uh, you know improve the distribution of PPs. And then uh, we also opened lines of importation, and there were special flights that were coming, in, although the Borders and airports were closed. Spare flies were coming in, bringing uh, you know uh, face by other uh, you know PPs from uh, abroad. So now uh, you know there are, there are a lot of people who have are now uh, you know some of those uh, uh, what we call them I call them uh, Shylocks. Uh, they they are they are now left with a large stock of PPs that they cannot get rid of because the prices are. Too high, so now the movement, uh, the distribution has improved uh, significantly because we are now doing local production. So that's some of the uh, silver lining with this with this uh, pandemic. In that, because many borders were closed, now countries are looking within themselves to try and and do what they can to be self-sufficient. Anything you wish to, to share? You talk about the poverty, but any any, any other thoughts? No, one of one of my concerns in this in this time. I think we have to separate uh, three main things. One is patients' care, and I feel it was important for our group that the patients didn't feel that we abandoned them from one day to another. So uh, we did telemedicine. Actually, it wasn't telemedicine at the beginning. It was just phone calls and how are you and how is your family? And that's why I'm telling you there are lots of people that had a wealthy system, health system, and, and working uh, progress. And now they have no work, they have no money, they're, they're, they're taking the children off from schools, private schools are losing the children. Public schools in Chile, we have sad, sadly a very divided public system and public system. So it's difficult because the children, they're not going to school. So there's lots of issues, not only health problems. And I have to address that because it's more than COVID. It's more than only infection or disease. It's, 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 it's a social problem. Yeah. And it's been here and it will stay here for a long, long time. Even if we have the vaccine soon, sooner or later, till we are all vaccinated and we have all the immunity system on, on top, there's a lot of time, even years, that we have to deal with this. So it's difficult for me. I, I'm, I'm one of the persons who are staying at home I, I'm, I'm, I'm staying at home, working from home, and afraid of to going as as Carmen Gloria mentioned to the supermarket or to pharmacy, um, because it's 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 more than only hospital. It's more than only uh, health. It's it's a social problem, and I I think we have to to work towards that. Maybe our children they don't need a surgery right now. They need food. They don't need speech therapies. They need social help and and a school system. So maybe we have to work towards something that it's more global, that only cleft care. Yeah, I don't or, know if I have, I have actually addressed seen, what I wanted to say. It's a good point, and it, it, we're not the, disconnected from that. We shouldn't be disconnected from that reality. And I've actually seen some cleft teams sort of turn around and put efforts towards nutrition, towards uh, so the social support, which families support education. Uh, so it's a great point. Uh, and I saw a lot of people sort of assenting us and, and nodding, in, uh, as you were mentioning, those, those, those items. Um, Marina, you're, you're now on mute. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, well, I, I think, as, as Karen said, it's not only cleft, it's not only COVID uh, and involves a lot of more stuff. We don't have the lack, the, we, I think in India, for example, you have a lot of spiritual tools. And I think we um, are very poor in spiritual tools. And I think people are afraid, uh, are depressed, have no food, no money at the moment. Um, we ask them to stay at home. And the problem is that if they don't go outside home, they don't eat. So it's, it's a very vicious circle. Um, 
I think we really have to support people through a lot of other tools and and give them at least the option to know that they can breathe and they can find just a little moment of inner peace uh, to stay going with the day. Uh, so um, it's this, it's we can support people through the phone, but legally, for example, in Chile, if we are not in our working place, we can't deliver health to the people in a legal form. So, uh, for example, in Fundacion Dance, if we will deliver telemedicine, we have to go there, but uh, the, uh, this area is still in lockdown. So there are a lot of other issues trying to deliver a proper uh, medicine and also for, for, for all the people working in, in, in the different places, you know, for the, for the, for the whole staff, um, they are afraid, they are stressed. Uh, and so we, we also have to think not only in the EPP, that's another stress issue because you have to put all the stuff in and you have to take them off and have the care that avoid the infection. Not all people are prepared for use them properly. So I think as Karen said, there are so many, so many things. Uh, things you have to, to look after. So Marina, you bring up a lot of really good points, but one of the critical ones I feel is the patient centeredness and what it really, what it really means to be a part of a team that is, is patient centered. Uh, what can we do? overcome some of those and really acknowledge all the needs. Uh, well, it's it's mind-boggling, but uh, we yeah. will have, hopefully we'll continue to share some of the, the, the examples of how we are addressing that, but hugely critical. I have maybe two more minutes. And Mami, I'm gonna put you on the spot. You are in Madagascar. Uh, seems like you have a pretty good connection. Uh, would you mind maybe sharing your thoughts? And, and I'll jump to, to Sylvia, who I've seen to be assenting and, and see if we can get to Nettie or Nana or, or Anna before we... Yeah. We just have four four more minutes so yes. yeah thanks Ruben um, I I want to also emphasize on um, supporting the volunteers since we do a lot for um, like we care a lot about our patients um, but for us um, I'm working for Operation Smile in Madagascar and we work a lot with volunteers uh, they're part of the team and there's it's one thing being part of a team and uh, getting paid but it's another thing uh, being volunteer and since there's no programs running um, how it's a challenge to continue to motivate volunteers and get them engaged uh, in our programs uh, we have one of our volunteers here. I don't want to put her on the spot um, in this on this round table, but I think uh, we've done like providing PPE since most of them are on the front line right now. Providing PPE is um, providing um, nutrition support as well, or um, some uh, supplements or vitamins or anything that can motivate them but also uh, encouraging uh, them to participate in webinars, keep learning, keep continuing to extend the, the, the network and all the partnerships. So I think we need to, to uh, not only look at patients, not only look at our team, but also uh, and mostly on our volunteers as well. Yeah, just people around us. Uh, thank you very much, Mami. Uh, you know, you're, you have quite a massive need, these are challenges uh, in Madagascar, and having to respond. Sylvia, are you still online? And if not, I think we have lost you. Yeah, hi, Sylvia. Any, 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 any last thoughts? <laughs> yes, I, I want to share with you that um, in our hospital, we, we have the um, Art of Living organization from India uh, to help us. Um, they they gave us um, special meditation session, sessions for all the the, the professionals and the, the, the people that work at that hospital that 
was a very, very good experience. Now they are preparing a special activity for our patient in a chat group, in WhatsApp group. And um, in the, the beginnings, we, we start a um, telemedicine consult, but uh, now uh, from dentists, phono, phono, uh, therapists, um, but now we are uh, focused on the emotional uh, feelings and the emotional um, situation for the patient. So we are, now we are especially uh, working on that because we discovered that they, uh, at the beginning they, they were uh, enthusiastic uh, and they shared the, 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 the teeth uh, videos, the teach, um, uh, techniques video for us, but now they they are very very depressed. They have all the problems the Karen and Marina share, and for now they are not important for them only health. So we are uh, working in, in other areas to to um, support them, to uh, fill them. Uh, let them feel they are not abandoned. They, we are with them and making all we can for them. Huge, hugely important concept that our patients are not abandoned, we're there for them. And we have to also be there for each other. Um, I think we've come to, to, to the end of our, our session. I have a feeling that we could spend hours uh, talking to each other about this and sharing some, some of our unexperienced experience. And I hope we will continue to do this. There will be opportunities for us to continue to share. I, I want to thank uh, Abdon uh, for helping us organize this session, and 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 also we have Behan who's been taking copious notes, trying to gather all the all the lessons so that we can share them amongst ourselves and with our friends and, and, and colleagues. Um, and uh, and I obviously want to thank our panelists who prepped some wonderful presentations for us and, and concepts and principles. Really bravo! And we need to thank all of you because I I. I it became more than some conference panel presentation. I, I, to me, at some point, I felt so comfortable that I almost felt like we could be in a living room just sharing with each other. And, and that says a lot about the interconnectedness and the desire to help that we all share. Uh, so I wish you a lot of um, health, safety, uh, togetherness with your families, and, and celebrate your commitment to patients. It's really been a pleasure. 